Your mom. Okay. Now, Dr. Goldman, in your book, you quoted uh, psychologist Paul Ekman as saying, I've never met anyone who is having such a good time <laughs> continually seeing the humorous side of nearly every situation. This is the Dalai Lama he's talking about. Um, but at the same time, we, we talk about the, the idea that the Dalai Lama never forgets for an instant about the suffering of his people. Uh, how does he function in both of those states, would well, you say? Well, I think the latter question I'll turn to Bob for, but let me give you my answer. First of all, Paul Ekman is the world's expert on the facial expression of emotion. Uh, and he has developed a template, which is now even automated. Uh, it's computerized, where you can analyze the fine muscle movements of the face and catch even what he calls micro-emotions, which are uh, indicators of an emotional state like anger that the person doesn't want you to feel, or know you f that they feel, that they're, they're trying to hide it. So he's like a dangerous guy because he knows how you really feel. Yeah. In fact, when I was, yeah, Paul Ekman was in the meeting on destructive emotions, and once uh, we had a pre-meeting, and I was walking with Paul, and he was telling me about this um, method of analyzing micro-emotions, and, and I, we're getting to the room where the meeting is, and I had this thought, oh, this is so interesting. I hope he wraps it up, though, because I have to think what I'm going to do in the meeting. Right then he said, and if someone had studied this, they'd know you're getting angry with me right now. <laughs> He's really dangerous. Anyway. Paul was, had a life-changing experience with His Holiness. Uh, and it was that uh, Paul had a miserable childhood and as a result uh, flared up in anger in ways that was very self-defeating for him. All his professional, he was notorious. For, you talk about getting angry, he'd fly into a rage and it would end a working relationship. So uh, what happened was that during a break in the meeting, Paul's daughter wanted to meet the Dalai Lama. She was there. And so he brought her over in the tea break. He just sat there during the tea. And he took Paul's hand and he held it while he talked to Eve. And Paul said he felt this pulse of heat radiating through him. And after that, he didn't have an angry thought for about a year. It just totally <laughs> transformed him. But he also said that the Dalai Lama's face was the most amazing he had ever seen, because he's a student of faces. He said his face, first of all, uh, for, expresses the full range of human emotion. He says every other face has learned to uh, not censor, but not to show certain emotions. He's, he's there for every feeling. And whenever he's with someone, he immediately reflects their feeling. That's that presence. Mm -hmm. and, but if it's very, if the person is in a negative mood, he drops it immediately. His baseline, his default range is, is a kind of joy. So then you have to juxtapose that because if you read Man of Peace, which I really recommend, you see that he has lived through horrors. I mean, things that would traumatize <coughs> anyone. And he also is, you know, feels the trauma of the ongoing trauma of the Tibetan people. And you wonder how can both those things coexist in one person? How can they? So, uh, yes, His Holiness, um, in the book, we had a kind of uh, uh, ongoing concern, I especially did, about showing the, the atrocities of the Chinese invasion and occupation of Tibet and the ongoing, I call it an ethnocide, which is a word I made up, but a Ethnic? ethnocide. Eth oh, an ethnic it's group. Instead of ethnic cleansing, I, yeah. I, think I like the word ethnocide, uh -huh. and uh, which they, are, they have been doing for 50, 60 years. And, um, and uh, well, who wants to stir it up type of thing? But we felt that uh, I, we, we've had a certain, we think, came up with the right balance, I think. Uh, and it's important because he's showing his, the Dalai Lama's peacefulness and his nonviolence and his compassionateness that he manifests to people is in the context of his extreme awareness of what his, uh, his people are going through. And uh, he once actually wept in a meeting with me and Nina and Ozzy Warner a few years ago, when the, they were, the ladies were saying that they wished he would talk more vigorously a little bit about Western politics. And there was a while when he was first coming to America where he kind of, was kind of unofficially let known, he was, uh, he was known like, please don't bring up anything political, a, a -political. Heard, religiously. Right. Right. So he wouldn't mention anything, but they were kind of encouraging to do it. And he actually cried. And he said that when he says in Europe or anywhere something about, oh, so-and-so got mistreated or such-and-such such is a thing, 
he gets a back channel message that they just tortured like six people in this prison. Oh, is that, that right. At the time, you know, he, he did, and probably still. So we thought it was necessary to show the reality of what has happened with Sved. And he also likes that, and he wants that to be shown. And yet then he wants to dialogue with them, and he doesn't hate them, and he, he considers them his teachers, even Mao and all of them. Uh, even though they are doing, they have done a lot of harm to Tibet, and they continue to do so. Uh, although he and he, he thinks that uh, you know. Yes, I had an interview just a few days ago with Joe Donahue, that this radio guy up in the Hudson Valley, and he told me that he interviewed his Holmes about seven, eight years ago, and he said, "Your Holmes, what do you make of the fact that the Chinese are so aggressive against you? And although everybody in the world likes you, nobody really thinks that you're." sort of vision of society or history or politics is practical or something, and, 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 and what is it that, how do you react to that? So his holiness said, wait. Uh -huh. So One word, he said, wait. That's right. And in, in fact, in, in Force for Good, where he outlines his vision for the yeah. world, uh, you know, he basically there's three parts. One, get your inner act together, practice, meditate, therapy, whatever works. Second, adopt an outlook of compassion. Mm -hmm. And third, act now in whatever way you can to make the world right. better. And he outlines the three or four areas like uh, you know, educating children or the environment or social justice, helping the needy, all of that. But he says, to my way of thinking, things are actually getting better. Even though the news today is grim, that's an imbalanced view of, of reality. Mm -hmm. And as a you know, a reformed journalist, I have to say it's true because what makes the headlines of the New York Times is what's new and disturbing. And it happened to them, not to us. That's, that's one of the, you know, gripping things about the news. Right. But if you looked, uh, as, as he points out, if you looked every day at all of the acts of cruelty in the world yes. and you balance them against all the acts of kindness and civility, the, the acts, all the good outweighs the bad by that's far. Right. And it, it's just not news. So he takes the long view. Yes. He says, this is a map for the next century. He says, I'm most interested in young people in, because it's them, the people of the 21st century who are going to be the generation that starts to fix things. Mm -hmm. And it's a long-term program. I have to say, he's a masterful strategist. Mm -hmm. He has uh, the okay. ability to think strategically in, in a long horizon. And there's a... Uh, a Native American word for leader, which actually translates as one who thinks far into the future. Mm -hmm. And he's that kind of leader. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He, just, he definitely is. And yeah. he keeps coming back, you know. That's, that's where it's a silly thing to pick him as an enemy because even you kill him, he'll pop up again. 